So what we're going to do today is, I'm going to repeat myself again, is that we're going to do muscle contractions and resistance of the muscles in the leg. And I'll show you the combined forces because a lot of the uh, muscles within the leg don't just do one particular movement in one direction. They're, they're a combination of about two directions, two movements. So that's to gain, uh, to do the function that they're supposed to do. So what I'm going to show you is to do where to resist in order to actually test those muscles. When uh, uh, some of you in the two hour session would have already have um, looked at how I resisted it in order to see the tendons as well as the feel, the muscle belly. So it's just to reinforce that. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to just do isometric contraction. So you would have, you would know by now how to perform a concentric as well as an eccentric. It's the same principles that we touched on in the session where we describe how we actually differentiate those. Now, the only difference for, a, for the leg muscles is that because a lot of muscles control movements of the ankle and the foot. That means that a lot of things that um, would use the weight of the lower limb doesn't apply anymore. For example, when we're doing the hamstrings, when we're doing eccentric contraction, we would do and just slowly let that down. Essentially, we're using the weight of the entire leg to help us be the weight. In this, for the foot, it mu it's much harder to do that because the foot itself is fairly small. So therefore, it does not provide enough weight in order to create that um, weight for you to do the eccentric. So you might have to use the uh, much more hands-on um, method of doing it through your, through, through your, putting force through the foot itself or putting a weight at the end of the foot in order to create that weight to perform the eccentric contraction. You got that? Okay, so that's something that you need to take note of, especially for different body regions. Right, so uh, we'll, move on, we'll move slowly through the different muscles and I'm going to show you any questions, just raise your hands and, I, and, and, and just ask me the question and I'll try to answer them. Um, can I have a volunteer? You don't have to be in your shorts, but it'd be great if you are. In, all I need to do is take off your shoes and your socks. So you just lie back for me. All done. Okay, so the very first muscle that we're going to do is the tibialis anterior. So can you tell me what the tibialis anterior does in terms of those movements? Dorsiflexion and inversion. Inversion. Okay? So if you look at the where the um, look at where the um, tendon of the tibialis anterior is and where its tendon is located. It's really doing a dorsiflexion and inversion. So if the let me just raise this up. So let me scoop down. So if the tibialis anterior does this and does this, so if you can see that straight away the uh, if the person is helping you to contract, the tendon shows up. So it's that direction that it actually does. In order to resist it. If it's moving in that direction, if you want to resist it, where should the force, you, where is the direction of the force you should be applying? That way, isn't it? So it's direct opposite of that. So this is where the foot goes, this is where you should be applying. If you look at the videos that I've shown you in the, um, in the handouts, it's, the instructions are very confusing because they use the um, direction, the names, the anatom anatomical direction, move movement of the foot to describe where you should put a force. That just confuses students no end. So what I want you to do is to ignore that and just simply think about where the foot goes and just simply uh, combine to create the resultant force and simply then put your hands, give a force that is directly opposite of that. It's as simple as that. So if it's for the ankle, uh, for the tibialis anterior, if it's that way, so if I were to resist it, I simply make sure that I stabilize the ankle. Now because he's not, his ankle is not over the edge of the bed, so which means that um, we have to make sure that his, um, his um, heel is off the edge because you can see that if he does that, anything, it's restricted and there's a friction there. So one way you can do is simply to hold it there, to just lift, lift it up. Another way is to pass me a pillow. And thank you. And then just simply put it underneath to create that elevation. That's as simple as that. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And if you can't see over there, just move around. It should be fine. So can you now 
hold it there, okay? And because I'm doing isometric, so don't let me move you. See that? And he's doing very hard a contraction of the tibialis anterior. What am I doing here? Why am I doing that? Because what I'm doing is I've got a hand that's here that is stabilizing the leg and another hand that's here that's creating the movement. So essentially if I take that away, I'm doing this. Got that? I'm doing this. Okay, obviously the movement that you want is mainly this hand, but the reason why I'm still moving this one is to, for stabilization purposes. And sometimes that is a very good, you've got very good leverage, okay, as compared to that. These are two potential movements that you can do for do testing uh, limbs and creating forces. These are very good um, sort of hand positions because it, it creates, it, it, it uses your chest muscles a lot, which are quite strong, okay, it won't tire out tie you out so easily. That's the tibialis anterior isometric contraction. We'll go on to the next one, which is extensor digitorum longus. Okay, so extensor digitorum longus controls what movement? Extension of the toes. Digitorum, so the toes, second to the fifth. Okay, second to the fifth. So if it's a longus, that means that we know that longus has got a longer lever arm and it attaches onto the base of the distal phalanx. It's the same for upper limb and lower limb. Longus attaches to the base of the distal phalanx. And then the bragus attends, uh, attaches itself to the middle. Okay, or the, if it's the uh, if thumb or the big toe is the proximal phalanx. Okay, so it touches that. And do you remember it forms this nice little sort of system, pulley system that hooks on. So this is the longus and this is the brevis, okay? And it creates that sort of um, movement, sliding movements. So if it's extensor, so it means that the toes are doing that direction. So in order to stop that, firstly, we put the ankle in a relaxed, slightly neutral, and then you want to hold on to the big toe so that it does not so that the person knows that this is not what you want them to do. And now I want you now to point your toes upwards towards you, okay? It's actually very hard to control, and if, especially if you, because the foot acts as a one unit most of the time. So to actually do that particular, sometimes it's quite hard. And what you do is, once you got the person to actually isolate the four, you can then, now don't let me move you, and simply do that, okay? Now realize that, Doing that is actually not very stable, so what I'm doing is I'm going to shift my hand and hold on to the metatarsals in order to stabilize the entire foot. And do that, and then using my thumb to control the big toe so that he doesn't use it. Okay, so I'll do that. Okay, now it's not very strong. In fact, your hands are much stronger than your um, extensor digital longus. So you can actually just test doing that. Now, if you were, is it possible to test the um, extensor digitorum brevis in isolation to longus? Do you think? No, it's not, unfortunately. As much as you want it to be, but we can't really do that unless you really go that and just isolate the uh, distal phalanx <coughs> and then get them to do that. Can you do that? No. <laughs> It's impossible, okay? At, at least for the extensors, it's impossible. For the flexors, you may be able to do it, but still, it's really difficult. Obviously, because the fingers are much longer, so it's much easier to actually isolate the longus, which is only the proximal phalanx, as compared to the middle phalanx, where you do that way as the brevis. And even that, there is contribution of the longus, okay? So, that's the extensor digital longus. What about extensor uh, helixus longus? What does it control? Big toe. Correct. Extension of the big toe. So we do the other, we do the right opposite of what we want to move is we stabilize, isolate only the big toe. And can you now point your big toe towards yourself? Good. So I've, I look, I, I've isolated that. Now I'm going to hold on to his, the metatarsals and just simply, can you now, no, don't let me move you and do that. Okay. 
You see that I'm only using my fingers because it's actually not very strong. If I use that, it's just too powerful. He would and make, make and make sure you don't push too hard on the big toe because then he will get cramped on the abductor. Okay, and which is not very nice as you would know. It's horrible. Okay, so that's the abductor helixus longus. That's a fairly easy one because it's similar to the others. What you can do is for the digitorum longus, you can also isolate each and each individual one. Is there any value to isolating each individual one? Not really. But if you want to do it because you've got lots of time in your clinic, you want to charge them a bit more money, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I didn't, I, I didn't tell it to you, even though it's been recorded. Um, so, um, there, there, there's absolutely no functional value to isolating each individual toe. The only, the only difference you want is between the big toe and the uh, four um, toes, okay? So that's extensor helixus longus. The next one is fibularis longus and brevis. It's quite difficult to isolate the two of them because they perform the same movements, even though they have got slightly different um, um, in, uh, distal attachments. So can you tell me what does the fibularis longus and brevis do? Eversion. Eversion and. Correct, plantar flexion. And the reason why it's plantar flexion is because the tendons or the fibularis goes behind the lateral malleolus. So the lateral malleolus acts like a, a sort of, a, what do you call it, pulley. Okay? So because of that, if you imagine this is the lateral malleolus, this is the tendon, and it goes curves around. The brevis goes here, the fibularis goes underneath the foot and goes to the other side. Okay? It becomes a pairing with the tibialis anterior. So now what they do is that it everts because it does that, but it also does that. So therefore it goes like that and like that. Plantar flex and everts. Okay, so what we do, so if you get the person to actually do a plantar flexion and then eversion and hold it there, so the force that the person is exerting is down uh, plantar flexion that way and eversion that way. So the resultant force is that direction. And therefore, our resistance force should be going that way. Up my arm, because I'm using my arm as the resultant force and I simply do, you see that my hand just goes down. So a most comfortable position for that would be this. So it's the opposite direction, it's all the opposite direction of what tibialis anterior, uh, tibialis anterior is doing. Okay, so got that. So the other hand, stabilize. Um, the um, distal part of the leg, use your web or your palm, whichever is more comfortable for the person, and put it roughly where the fifth metatarsal is in order to make it comfortable. And then, now, let me try again plantar flexion and E version. There. Now, don't let me move you and do that. Okay? So, he's resisting, resisting very hard. If I want to double check if he's really contracting his fibrillaris, um, uh, longus and brevis, so hold it there, don't let me move you. As I do that, I just simply go and double check. So my, you see the base of my palm is still holding on and stabilizing the leg. Yeah, but I just simply then put my fingers in to double check if the tendons are tensed up and they are. So I'm correctly um, <coughs> resisting these two muscles and testing them. Got it? Cool. And relax. So that's fibularis longus and brevis. Okay, um, I won't go to the posterior. Comp uh, let's, let's see. I will go to the tibialis posterior. I'll skip one and I'll come back to that again because I need to shift him around. Um, so I'll do the tibialis posterior. So what does the tibialis posterior do? Think about it. Where it goes. Correct and. Correct, well then. So, because of, it's almost like the mirror image of your fibularis muscles. So, this is the medial malleolus. The tibialis posterior tendon goes down, curves around the back of the medial malleolus, and then inserts. And you know that tibialis posterior has got extensive uh, attachments onto the tarsal bones. Yeah? Okay, so navicular, your cuneiforms, your cuboid, and just goes down. And then it brings it in plantar flexion and then e invert. So it does this action, which is plantar flexion and then invert. 
Okay, when the person does that, okay, just double check and there should be a huge tendon popping up behind the medial mandibulus, very, very close to it. In fact, it's the first um, tendon that curves around the medial mandibulus so that you know that the person is activating that. So, in order to resist that, if, it, if, the, if the muscle is doing plantar flexion inversion, so the force is going that direction. Right? So we need to resist it that way. That way. Okay? No, actually, no. Hang on. Boop. Boop. Okay, we need to resist it that way. The reason is because the inversion goes curves all the way up. So, there you go. So it's that way. Repeat that again. <laughs> Plantar flexion inversion. So in all, I need to do uh, that direction. Okay, you ready? So again, stabilize the leg so that it doesn't move around like that. Stabilize it and then resist. Don't let me move you. And there you go. Okay. Let's try again, but this one slightly different hand hold where I'm actually holding on to the foot. Got it? Good. And relax. Tibialis, tibialis posterior. Next, we're going to do the flexor digitorum longus. Flexor digitorum longus, what does it do? Flexes the toes. Flexes the toes. So essentially, it just does that, the right opposite of the extensor digitorum longus. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to take a seat. Um, So make the person comfortable and then you want to make sure that you isolate the big toe so that it doesn't do anything for you. Okay, you only want these four toes to. So can you now curl your toes downwards? So there you go, he's done a very good job of just isolating the four toes. And what you simply need to do is to, there are different ways of doing it. If, you are, if I was sitting over here or over here, then I will just use my four fingers to contract the four and just simply do a extension movement to contract the flexion of the toes. But because I'm in this position right now, it doesn't really matter. I just simply use my thumb or any part. In fact, I can use the base of my palm as well. But because I want it to be precise, I use my thumb and resist all four. Okay. Now because I'm actually resisting at the tip and I'm, I'm not isolating, so essentially I'm resisting both longus and brevis at the same time. Okay. Now if I want to isolate just the longus, then what I'll do is I'll hold on to the middle phalanx and then get, can you just now curl the top of your toes, just a red little, you don't need to use a lot of force. You see that he's, he's very good. Okay, not all patients are like, or, or, or models are like that. She can actually isolate the, the, distal, uh, the distal phalanx, so great for you. Now, what you need to do is you need to then Use your fingers and simply, okay, relax, just the top bit. Okay, you can see that I, he starts starting to try to flex the entire, um, uh, the, the, the other phalanx as well. Okay, just push against me. Good, well done. Just a little bit will do so that you are, yeah, good. Just follow my instructions and now we've isolated the longest. So it's just a very little, very little tiny sort of force that's actually going on. Okay, if you want the brevis, obviously, you do that. And because the brevis goes on to the middle phalanx as well, so it creates movements in the metatarsal phalangeal joint as well. So for that, you just simply make sure to isolate the big toe. Just simply don't let me move you and do that. Got that? Or you can grab on. Just don't let me move you. Do that as well. Okay? Again, there's no particular value in doing the individual ones. If you want to, go ahead. But there is no particular value, functional value anyway. Next one would be obviously flexor, helixus, longus. Same as the digitorum. Is a distal attachment, uh, the distal, the distal attachment at the base of the distal phalanx again. So you need to isolate all your little toes so that um, it only the big toe that is um, flexed. So can you pull your big toe for me? Oh, this one's not, he's not so good. Okay, I'm gonna try and make sure that it doesn't. Okay, now, just a big toe. It's actually very hard. He's actually doing an exceptionally good job at, at, at it. Okay, so now, 
Hold it there, okay? Okay, and relax. Okay, if I do it a bit slightly more extend, slightly more extended, maybe he can do it. Okay, now he curls his toe, and then he's actually resisting me using his uh his four other toes. Okay, now. If you can't do it, then there's no point in pursuing because it just simply means that actually most people can't really do it. So what you can do is just simply push and resist flexion of the big toe and automatically he'll activate that. Okay, so just don't let me move you. Okay, he's trying his very best to actually isolate it to the big toe, but he's still actually contributing some of the, uh, the flexor digitorum. But right now he's actually mostly, because I'm actually exerting more resistance on the big toe now, Actually, putting more effort on that, and that's your, and that's how you test for the extens uh, flexor digitorum, uh, no, flexor helixus longus. Got it? Check is there anything else? Okay, one last one, but this one is I'll need him to uh, go prone. So if you just lean forward slightly. I'm gonna put this down. Okay, don't lean back. Don't lean back. I need you to go prone. Okay, so the next two are the um, gastrocnemius as well as the soleus. So for the gastrocnemius, okay, I'm just going to take that away as well. Are you comfortable? Can you now shift it such that your ankle is over the edge of the bed? Good. Okay, now for the gastrox, is a two jointed. It's a two joint, uh, it's a, it, it crosses over two joints, so it contributes to knee flexion as well as ankle plantar flexion. In order to test it, uh, what we need to do is place the knee in slight extension, or if you want slight flexion like that, sometimes if the hamstrings are quite tight or if the gastrocs are quite tight, you can put it a pillow just to support it so that it's got about 5 to 10 degrees of knee flexion, which is fine. Okay, and then what you want to do is to get them to um, plantar flex down like that. I'll, I'll use this one because then you can see down, and you can see straight away the gas drops are moving. But we need to do an isometric. So there are different ways of doing it. You can use your arms. You can use upper limb to resist. So what I do is, if I'm using my upper limb, what I do is I need I'll stabilize the leg so that it doesn't flop around. And then what I'll do is I'll put my palm either that way or that way, but my elbow will be locked, locked on my body. And the reason for that is because I don't want to move that way so that I'm not using my shoulders to do that. Okay, if the person's very strong, you might hurt your shoulders. So I'm using my body to actually give that leverage and resistance. So I'm essentially doing that. I'm using my body weight to lean in. Okay, and that create that's more, more efficient in terms of your um, in, in terms of the energy you're using as well. So hold on to that, okay? Stance so that you are you won't fall over. Now, can you hold it there? Don't let me move you. So when I do that, I just simply lean in. You can see that I'm just simply leaning in. If I just go, yeah, you can see that I'm actually just leaning in. And you can see his gastrocs working really hard. Okay, so that's isometric gastrocs. In fact, this is nothing compared to if he was taking his own weight. Okay, so you really have to work really hard in order to really test the gastrocs. Okay, so I'm really leaning upper, my upper body weight is now in, and he's still able to resist me. And that's how strong the gastrocs are. If I were to, if I was a bit lazy, which I always am, okay, then I'll put it down, and then what I'll do is. Can you now point your toes down and don't let me move you? And now simply use my thighs to lean in. Like that. Okay? So I'm just, I'm not using, even using my hands. I'm just using my thighs to just lean in and just simply push my body weight onto it to resist. Whichever you prefer, it doesn't really matter. Okay? So long as you're comfortable with it and you're getting the right resistance. So that's gastrox. Now, next one, soleus. Oh, soleus. So, soleus, similar function to gastrox, but because the attachment is different, therefore it only crosses one joint, therefore it only crosses the ankle joint. It, does still, it still does plantar flexion. How do we then get rid of the gastrox in theory? Bend the knee. Correct. You bend the knee like that. Okay. 
So when you bend the knee, um, <coughs> some some uh, videos um, and some tutors would tell you that <coughs> test it. You need to get them to plantar flex. So if you have plantar flexes, so you have to resist that by using holding on the, to the um, calcaneum and pushing there like that. Okay. I personally don't like that. The reason for that is because my hands are fairly bony, as I told you before. So it creates a lot of pain at the front of the knee, uh, the uh, leg, especially on the shin, or the anterior border of the tibia, as well as on the calcaneus. So what I prefer is actually to do what I did for the gastroc. It's exactly the same. It, it's, 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 it's just the way you test it. It's slightly different. So I prefer this. So I'm going to switch legs now. So it's much easier because you want it to be as close to you as possible in order to get the leverage. If it's the other leg, I tend to be asking the person to shift to the, the edge and then go around. It's much easier to do that. You can get a model to do the work for you. And then what you do is actually it's not all the way. That's well enough now. So now, hold it there and don't let me move you. So what I'm doing is I am leaning in using my upper body weight. Okay, and my other hand is to stabilize so that when I lean in, it doesn't go anywhere. It just holds it there and just lean in. And that tests it. You can see that his gastroc are still working really hard. So, uh, but you can feel the soleus more now. So, in, functionally speaking, it's really hard to actually separate these two, but you can try to decrease the activation of the gastroc as much as you can. Got that? Good. Okay, so let me check the time. We've got time to actually practice. Would you like to bring the small groups now and then do that and then I'll come help you. So, um, do you think you can all stay in this room or do you want to go to the other room as well? Yeah, it's up to you. I'm okay with it. I'm actually okay with it.